All right, so next up we're going to have Aparna up here for the first time reading a, reading a book. <laughs> I guess I'm the room interruption for all this wonderful music you've shared. Thank you all for the lovely music. Um, this book is called The Twentieth Wife. And I still have not read it. I just came here thinking I'm going to sit here on the couch and read this book. And then I thought, hey, this wonderful gentleman said, go and read this book. And that's why I'm here reading this book out to you all. So let me know whether you guys want to hear a short version of the love story or a longer version of the love story. <laughs> so let me give you a little bit of history behind this. As you see, the book itself, it's got an Indian woman in a sari. It's written by an Indian authoress. And this was taken in, uh, set in um, uh, 1658. It was set when India was ruled by the Muslim kings. So there's a little bit of history, a lot of history in this book. So this is about um, one of the prince of India, his name is Salim, and how he quotes a woman who's not supposed to be his um, status. Um, she's supposed to be one of the lonely status girls, and but how he really loves her and he likes her beauty. So let me go ahead with the book. This is chapter 5, and um, when his gaze seemed to devour her, she, as by accident, drops her veil, and shone upon them at once with all her charms, the confusion which she could well feign on the occasion heightened the beauty of her face. So this setting is in a little bazaar, where, not bizarre, bazaar, where, I can't, I need to stand up here. Actually, I'd like to stand here so I can get more of the light and the hand mic will be good. The Mina Bazaar was in full swing at the Royal Palace. For three days every month, the harem palaces were thrown upon to traders and merchants, who were allowed to set up stalls to display their wares. Since the ladies of the Zamana went unveiled in the Mina Bazaar, only women were allowed to sell the goods. The merchants sent their wives and daughters to keep, to keep shop on their behalf. The ladies of the imperial Zamana shocked, haggled, and bargained to their heart's content and the emperor joined them on their activities. The bazaar gave the harem ladies a sense of freedom and much pleasure, so Akbar, the emperor, named the place the Days of Joy. Prince Salim swayed from side to side in the corner of the Mina Bazaar, his eyes dull. He stretched himself and flexed his arms. A shout of laughter came from a jewelry store, and Salim turned towards the sound more out of reflex than curiosity. The emperor stood there, his arms around two pretty concubines who were squealing with laughter as the lady of the stall tried to haggle with him for a pair of emerald bracelets. Salim's wives stood near him, gazing wistfully at the gaily festooned stalls. The prince gave them an irritable glance and then called to the chief eunuch of the harem. Hoshiar, go with my wives and help them select some satin and gold cloth. Yes, your highness. Hoshiar Khan bowed, turned, and raised his hand to guide Salim's wives, his face impassive. He looked thoughtfully at the prince, wondering at his listlessness. The prince had not been himself for a few weeks now. Not since his encounter with the girl in Empress Rukhaya's apartments. Hoshiar made sure to keep himself informed. Through his acquaintance of knowledge, he had worked his way up the ranks to his current position with cunning and a ruthlessness that helped him get rid of any rivals. In the Zanana, the ladies treated him with respect and a little fear. For anything Hoshiar knew to their detriment invariably found its way to the princess. Hoshiar bowed to only one woman, the woman who ruled Salim's harem, Princess Jagat Gosini. He 
He was her eyes and ears outside the walls of the harem, within it her right-hand man. She would make a powerful enemy. Now she worried about Mehrun Nisa. Why? Salim seemed to have forgotten him. But not completely. He was floundering, grasping for something out of, the re out of reach and not really knowing what it was. Oh, and take the others with you. I wish to be alone, the prince said. The servants scampered off with glee. Salim turned slowly and walked towards the gardens. On the way, a vendor yelled out to him, Your Highness, look at these beautiful birds. A young girl sat at a stall surrounded by brass cages, each containing a variety of colored birds. She was quite pretty, her coarse features brightened by her smile. Salim eyed her with appreciation. Taking advantage of his interest, she brought forward a, a miner with a bright yellow bill. Now, isn't that pretty, Your Highness? She tried to cajole, stammering as she did so. Selim grinned, watched her bravado disappear. She had been bold in calling to him, but now that he stood in front of her, she was suddenly shy. How much? A special price for you, Huzur. She batted her eyelashes becomingly, just five rupees. Then, uh, Selim said, three. Oh, Huzur, she, the vendor sighed, putting away the cage. I wish I could sell it to you for three rupees, but the cost of living is so high. She suddenly brightened. I will take four for it. Only if you throw in the two pigeons, Salim said, pointing at the two pristine, unspeckled Persian pigeons. Done. Salim brought out four silver rupees from his kamabund and handed them to the girl. He wanted to give more for such a fine performance, but it would spoil the little game. He looked around for Oshiyan, who as usual was not far away from his side, despite Salim's order to go wait on his wives. He handed the miner to Oshiyan, took out the Persian pigeons and held them to his chest. They cooed softly in his arms. He rubbed his cheek against his feathers and descended the stone steps into the garden. The noise from the bazaar seemed to fade away. The green lawn stretched out in front of him, luminous with morning dew. Bees drone over the flowers, their wings iridescent in the warm sunlight. His eyes were caught with red roses on the border in a heavy bloom. The thorns had been trimmed by the royal Malis, each painstakingly removed by hand to protect the royal family. Hey you, she rose and walked up to the prince. Hold these for me. Selim handed her the pigeons and went off to pluck the roses. When he came back, the girl was standing there eyes downcast, holding just one pigeon. Where is the other bird? He demanded angrily. Your Highness flew away. How? Like this? To Salim's amazement, the girl lifted her hands, her blue glass bangles falling back with a tinkle on her wrists, and welcomed and, re and, re and released the second bird. It flew away into the distant sky. He turned back to her, enraged. She was watching the pigeon, his memory stirred. Where had he heard that voice before? A slight breeze swept through the garden, and the veil molded her face. Mehrunisa, your highness, I apologize. Salim waved an impatient hand, letting the roses fall to his feet. Never mind the bird. Why did you run away from me the other day? not stay. Why not? Salim reached for her hand and held it. Her fingers were long and slender. The nails henna tipped, the skin as smooth as pearls. They stood smiling at each other with no words, just happiness. Salim reached out and pulled her veil from her head. He took a deep breath and expelled it slowly. Suddenly, he ached to touch her everywhere, to feel her skin against his to hear her voice and her laughter. You are the most beautiful woman I've seen, Mehrunisa. She tilted her head at him. An errant breeze lifted a lock of her hair and blew it across her mouth. But you have so many beautiful women in your harem, Your Highness. Surely there's one who surpasses me in beauty. Salim tilted his head to the other side, 
his tone matching the lilt in her voice. That is simply not possible. What are you doing here alone in the garden? Why are you not in the bazaar? It tired me, as it did me. Salim raised his hands to her lips and rubbed his fingers over her back slowly. His touch then strayed down her wrist, rippling over the bangles. Your Highness, His Majesty desires your presence. Oshia was standing at the top of the stone steps. <laughs>